I don't know when American workers, the American working class, is going to explode. And I can't tell you when. I don't think it'll be that long. But what I can tell you tonight is why. Um, what I'm going to say is based really on two months of research I did last summer. I'm writing a play about the effect of climate change in Hurricane Katrina on New Orleans. Last summer, I spent two months interviewing people. I started with the actors in the theater company I was working with, and I worked outwards to their friends, to people they thought I should talk to, to different kinds of activists, to their mothers, do you know what I mean? To, all, to, all, to a big range of people. But I said to all of these people, I started it by saying something I had learned that most of the people in the world, in every country I've been to in the last two years, agree with, which is there's something dreadfully wrong with there's something wrong with this country. It really has to be fixed, but it's not going to be fixed, and no one in public life speaks for me. And I said, does that? Is, does that represent what you think? And every single one of them, no matter what their politics, said yes. That's what I think. And then I said, tell me about how that feels. And then I listened. It was a very educational experience listening because I'm a political activist. And I haven't listened to anybody else talk about politics for years. <laughs> But I didn't contradict them and I didn't give them answers. Some of us are desperate for answers, but I didn't give them, I just listened. They talk typically for three or four hours. They, a world of hurt. They ranged all over their lives. So it seemed like just jumping from one thing to another, but all of these kinds of hurt were all related to each other. They were all coming from the same system, and they knew that. And I've done a lot of different research in a lot of different places, and I would go home and take notes, and I didn't take any notes. And sometimes I had to have the whole of the next day off just to deal somehow with what they had said. And that's the important thing. What's gonna happen in America is coming out of a world of hurt, held down and screwed down. Now what I'm saying about New Orleans, New Orleans is of course, exceptional in many different ways. New Orleans is far and away the most beautiful city in the United States. It's beautiful in depth. New Orleans has a history of, New Orleans is the only city in the United States where the culture of the people at the top of society is the culture that was built by the black working class and worked its way up. New Orleans is the city where the music that dominates the world now was invented. New Orleans is a city with a fantastic history of class struggle. The first major southern city to fall in the, in the Civil War because the Irish and German soldiers of New Orleans refused, and the Confederate Army refused to fight the Union. <laughs> um, a city where they had a joint black and white general strike in New Orleans in 1892. A city where their main proverbial food is called the po' boy for poor boys. The po' boy was invented by two brothers who ran a restaurant, the Marx Brothers, who gave it free to the transit, locked out transit workers on strike in the, night, in the long, the bitter strike of the 1920s, and it was called the Poe Boys because those locked out transit workers were desperately poor and needed. That's their, you know, their national food in that city. So it's different, but it's not really different. Really, it's, and it's also different because of Hurricane Katrina. Not just because of all the dead that people were born, not just because of their feeling of abandonment by their government, not, uh, but because the government of the United States, because they know climate change and they know worse hurricanes are coming, have refused to rebuild the levees to, to, to strong enough to handle hand more than a, a, a level three hurricane. And a level five, at least, is coming. And everyone knows that. So those, that's everyone in the city, I checked. I knew it before I got there. Nobody ever says it in the city. Nobody ever says it anywhere. Everybody in New Orleans knows it. 
So that's different, but again, it's not really different. It's just one example of the many, diff the mosaic of suffering of the American working class. Where is this coming from? Let me set it in the political economy. <clears throat> in the late 1960s, the rate of profit, the return of profit on industry in all of the industrialized countries in the world went down by about half from what it was. So 25% to 12% in the United States, 40% to 20% in Japan, and so on. At first, profits are the life, other meetings will explain it. Profits are the life of the capitalism. They had to have the profits. At first, they thought, the people who ran the corporations and the government, that maybe this was a short-term thing and they could get around it. And when the first big slump as a result of the profits fall came in 73, 74, they thought maybe they could get around it. When the second big slump came in 78, 79, they knew they couldn't. And what we call neoliberalism began under President Carter. And neoliberalism, there were, there's the response of the corporations and the ruling class and the banks to this fall in profits, which happened then and continued and it stayed, it stayed down. Their response was twofold. One was what we call neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is basically an attempt to increase the share of the national income going to profits, going to the employer, from the share going to wages. So you cut wages, you speed up the job, you cut health and safety, you cut services, you cut the taxes on the, uh, on the, on the rich and so on. You, know, you cut everything so that you're not making, you can't get back so you're making more profits because you're investing in your industry is more profitable and more productive. You can't do it in that way, so you're getting a bigger and bigger share of the pie. The second thing that they did with neoliberalism was, uh, that went with neoliberalism, was an enormous global increase in debt. Debts on houses, debts on credit cards, debts between countries, debts of every kind in the world that ballooned and ballooned and ballooned from the late 60s on. Because if you can't make profit in productive industry, you try and make profit out of a bubble or out of loaning it to somebody. And actually, Greenspan's great breakthrough was the people whose wages you forced down all the way you give them a credit card and you give them a mortgage so that you have what they have left, they're paying even more of a percentage on it. You're keeping the demand up, even more of a percentage, and you're building a bigger and bigger and bigger bubble. Okay. Along with all of that, an enormous assault on human dignity. Because you need more and more and more and more bullying at work. And more and more and more subservience to make, in the United States is the extreme example, the thing that is true in, most, true in most countries of the world now, that most jobs are a lot harder and a lot faster and there's a lot more to the job than there was 20 years ago. That's at its most extreme in the United States. But also, inequality. Um, it went furthest in the United States, um, neoliberalism, and because it did, Inequality is greater in the United States than it is in any other industrialized country in the world. There's a, that wonderful book, The Spirit Level, Wilkinson talked on it yesterday, great talk, but a wonderful book, get it. I was watching that talk yesterday and I was thinking, on every <coughs> measure after measure after measure, the, the ways you can measure suffering, they're more in, the more unequal the society is. Once, uh, Things are terrible. For very poor countries, people simply don't have enough. But once you get to an industrialized country, once you get to all of Europe or North America or whatever, people have enough, and the level of suffering goes with the level of inequality. And graph after graph after graph after graph after graph after graph, in Wilkinson's book, people in the United States have it worst. So, more violence, more murders, more drug addiction, more alcohol addiction, more teenage pregnancies, more madness. When they do the same set of psychological tests for active madness in Japan, they get 8% of the population. That's the lowest. In the United States, it's 27% of the population. More obesity. 
<laughs> one quarter, <laughs> one quarter of the population of the United States is obese. And that hurts them inside, in their feelings, several times a day, every day. All of these measures are suffering. So the first thing you remember about Americans, if you're European, is they're just like us, but their lives are much harder. The second thing is, though, that their ideology is all about achievement, all about the American dream, all about social mobility. On Wilkinson's statistics, the United States has far and away the lowest rates of social mobility of any industrialized country in the world. And an ideology that tells you it's entirely and completely your fault if you don't succeed. And an ideology that enters deep. And an ideology wages. Wages in the United States, the median wage for a man in the United States now is the same as what it was in 1975. People are making what their grandfathers made, and they're working a lot harder to make it with a lot less dignity. You have all of that, and then you have the crash. And an enormous fork out for the bankers. And suddenly, unemployment is running 9% on the official statistics, plus another 2% they usually don't count because they're demoralized, plus another 8% who are working short hours, part-time hours, unpredictable hours, like one of my flatmates in New Orleans who was a cook who didn't know each day how much, it's almost all she talked about was how many hours she was gonna get that week. Um, plus, uh, and plus, of course, the 43 million people without health insurance, and those people without health insurance, by the way, those are all working people. The people who don't have jobs um, do, do have Medicare. So all of that, the crash, and the foreclosures, I mean, the foreclosures seem to be bigger than they are. The national figures, for instance, is only one householder in 50 lost their house to, more, uh, to foreclosure last year, plus so old people who lost their rented housing. Um, and in California, where it's high, it's still only one person in 15 loses their house every year. But in Massachusetts, the one of the women who was working in, as a carer in my mother's care home drove me home in a small town in Massachusetts and said, that person was foreclosed, and that person was foreclosed, and she was foreclosed, and she was foreclosed, and he was foreclosed, and she was foreclosed, and he was foreclosed. I'd asked who was foreclosed. I asked my daughter who lives on a hillside in Vermont, you know, has the uh, recession affected people around here, and she started with her husband, and then the house there, and then the house there, and then the house over there, and then the house over there. It feels, it feels, it's not everybody, but they feel it's everybody. Um, because I think everybody's afraid it will happen. So that's what's happening. So that's part of the rage, part of the explosion. But the other part is that it's screwed down so tight, nobody speaks to you. Everybody in the government is against you. The most important part of this, and the most troubling for people in New Orleans, white and black, was Barack Obama. Now you have to understand what Barack Obama is. Barack Obama is a member of the ruling class. He's a former editor of Harvard Law Review and a professor of law at the University of Chicago. <coughs> he, he, he is, his main, his two main sources, largest sources of funding when he was running for president in 2008 um, were um, two Wall Street brokerage houses, Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs. <laughs> the best. Those were his best funders. People feel betrayed. They feel betrayed because they thought he was going to do something different from what he said. If you listened to his campaign and during the campaign, he and McCain both supported the bailout of the bankers. Somewhere between 80 and 95 percent of Americans were quite correctly against that bailout. Everybody in Congress supported it. Um, Obama promised that he would increase the war in Afghanistan and that more Afghans and Pakistanis would be killed. That's not what he said, but that is what he was saying. And he has. He's increased the number of American soldiers in Afghanistan four times what George Bush had there. He's now having, taking them out, 
he will still have twice as many as George Bush had there. He, the great majority, a large majority of Americans are opposed to that war. I went to the meeting on Libya here, and people were saying about, I thought, I kept thinking, 75% of Americans are opposed to the American involvement in the war in Libya. 75% of Americans are against it. The majority of Republican voters are against the American war in Libya. Americans have had it with that stuff, but Obama and all of his people, <coughs> the Democratic Party are throwing, pulling it through. The only thing on which he betrayed what he promised was on climate change. On climate change, he was going to be sort of like Tony Blair. <laughs> Um, or Arnold Schwarzenegger. That was not that not as hard, but th that's what he promised. He was the person who went into Copenhagen and did what George Bush had never managed to do, which was to destroy the possibility of a global agreement on climate change. So that's the one place that's betrayed people. Well, it's very interesting in New Orleans. One, one, trade, union act, one trade union activist, a long-time shop steward, said Obama to me. Said Obama. Nobody else would talk about it when they got to politics. Nobody would talk about it. It hurt, it hurt too much what they had invested. And it also hurt because, I mean, God, I, I, I cried the night Obama was elected, and I, I cried at his inaugural. And I cried because I, I grew up in Texas under apartheid. But the reason that Obama really, that election really mattered, it wasn't that an African American got to be president. It was that the people of America voted for a black man to be president. And whatever happens, I never get out. <laughs> Obama is more and more unpopular because he's more and more, because he's a warmonger, because he's getting our, our kids, our sons and daughters killed and maimed, because, above all, because of jobs. <laughs> because people haven't got jobs. It's not just the government hasn't done anything about jobs. They haven't done anything about jobs. They're not even bothered. They're not even agonizing. So people, doesn't mean, Obama will probably win. They'll probably run somebody like Bachman or Payne or some other obvious dangerous evil person. <laughs> people will vote for Obama. In the same way, we would all vote for Cameron if they were running Bachman. Yes, they would be to tell you not to, but secretly you would. That's <laughs> <laughs> not the exact analogy, it's just a joke. But, <laughs> but, so that, that's the situation, but it's not, it's not just Obama. It's, except for Paul Krugman, except for very, very few other people in public life, it's all. And all of them with a deep, a deep class arrogance and a deep accepting of capitalism. Okay, now let me come to what people told me when I listened to them about what it's like to live inside that political economy with that grid screwed on top. The first thing to say was I was astonished at the level of rage. I mean real rage. I don't mean what the comrades in the SWP mean when they say people are really angry in this country and they're pleased that people are really angry. First of all, people are not really angry. They're just sort of a bit angry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and secondly, when people are really angry, it's not a joke for them or for anybody else. These people were really angry because they were really angry. They were really frightened. They were frightened of their anger. They would come up, they would say it, they would veer off, they come back to it, they would be unable to talk, they were so angry. They were, some of them, they were scared, partly there's an enormous anti-anger discourse, all of public life tells you you must not be angry, you must take a pill, and so on, you're quite likely to be beaten if you express anger in public, and so on. All of that, but also, a couple of people told me they were scared to kill somebody, and they wouldn't know they killed somebody until they had killed the person. One guy described getting out of his car because somebody pushed the horn line and getting out of his car. And, and the, he, he heard the horn from behind, and the next thing he knew, he was out of his car and leaning through the guy's window with his hands 
on the guy's neck. Jonathan, you have to stay by the mic. Oh, with his hands on the guy's neck, and he was a he was a big man, and he was um he was afraid. He said after that he stopped all political activity so that he could get his rage down to a level that was not dangerous. And you take it out on the people around you. Of course that's what you do. So people were very angry, they were frightened. As I said, they, it was more madness, more obesity, enormous levels of drug use. Most of it obtained from your doctor. <laughs> Most of it is antipsychotic drugs, which are more addictive and more dangerous than cocaine and heroin. Um, but also the levels of the levels of violence that they've seen, the levels of state repression. When Hurricane Katrina came, immediately in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans is in the center of one of the great oil and fields and oil refineries in the world. 200 miles of the Mississippi are oil refineries and petrochemical plants, and New Orleans is in the middle of it. They sent the army in to lock it down, the same as when they took Baghdad, and for the same reason. People had an awful lot of machine guns pointed at them. One, uh, one of my friends described in the French Quarter towards the end of four days after Katrina, lying on the roof, and there was no electricity, so she could see all the stars of the Milky Way above her from the French Quarter, which she would never see again. And she lay there all night watching the beauty and listening to the gunfire from the army. Another friend, five months later, standing on her college dormitory balcony, in, a, in the posh part of town, looking down towards the Mississippi at sundown, and a tornado was coming off the Mississippi five months after Katrina, still under occupation, tornadoes coming off the Mississippi, going round and round and round, and as it comes towards the posh part of town, it's turning off the lights. It's destroying the electricity substations, turning off the lights, so the lights are all going off, coming towards her. The sun is going down here, and the SWAT teams with the machine guns and the, and the automatic weapons, rather, and the armored personnel carriers are coming at the dormitory, and the sun went down, and the electricity went off, and the shooting began, and lasted all night. Um, I could tell stories about being arrested, but I won't, because we're a bit pushed for time. It's important to understand that this happened to white people, and it happened to white people. Black men's New Orleans had it bad. Five men's parish, overwhelmingly white, some Native American, some Vietnamese, but mostly white. Five men's parish, the last 60 miles of road down to, um, um, uh, down to the coast. We drove down there and we saw one house in those 60 miles, and endless mobile homes. Nobody's going to go to ask the five men's parish. Um, it's um, the thing that sticks in my mind. I have a friend who lost six people because of Katrina. His, his grandfather and his grandmother <coughs> died, as so many old people did, with low mobility because they couldn't climb up onto the roofs. They couldn't break through and climb up onto the roofs, so they drowned. Another elderly relative died, as so many people did, in a wheelchair in the airport. Um, uh, a cousin died as an electrician trying to do rebuilding. <coughs> trying to connect up things so people could go somewhere, and the, it, it was jury rigged, and it wasn't properly earthed, and he was electrocuted. But the one that stuck in my mind was his cousin who died because he'd taken on work as a deputy sheriff, a cop in Blackwood <coughs> Parish, this long uh, road, 60 miles long, and day after day after day for weeks, there was nobody there where he'd grown up, nobody at all. And he drove back and forth, that was his only job, drive back and forth to go along the line. And then one evening, he couldn't bear it anymore, and he pulled his car up onto the levee, and he sat down in his car, and he drank himself to death. But you can do it one night if you intend to do that. That's, that's what people were carrying. They were also carrying, they're carrying other things. They're carrying, American working class people used to be proud of being brave. Courage was a virtue I grew up with. They'd taken courage away from us. War after war after war we're fighting now, and they never mentioned bravery. 
because the American soldiers go into battle absolutely covered with body armor, and as soon as there is any chance of fighting, you call in the <coughs> helicopters and the airplanes with the bombs and so on, and you're fighting people who's, who have flip-flops on. You're fighting people of a norm. And you can't even have the bravery. You can't stand up to the boss. Go into an American restaurant. I've done this. You go into an American restaurant. The waiter or the waitress comes and says, I'm going to tell you about the specials now. And you I say, I, that's OK. I don't want to know about the specials. I saw them on the board. And she starts to tell me about the specials. And I say, this is terrible for you having to tell me about the specials, even when I've said I don't want you to tell about the specials. It's terrible that, you're, that your boss is doing this to you. And I will sit here quietly and listen to you. And I can see, she says not a word, and her lips don't move about what I'm saying. But I can see in her eyes that she's grateful I've said this. OK, I'm going to end with schools. It's not an accident that the revolt broke out in Wisconsin with school teachers. <clears throat> I mean, shame on our trade union leaders. In Wisconsin, it's illegal for teachers to go on strike ever. So their union leaders ordered every teacher in the state of Wisconsin to go sick on the same day and stay sick. <laughs> and they got sick and they stayed sick. And that's what the Bob Crows and the Sally Hunts of this world ought to be doing. But they, they, they did it, but it started with the teachers. And there's a reason. The teachers in New Orleans were the crucible of the misery and the rage. They had 5,000 teachers in New Orleans when Katrina hit. Two months after Katrina, they were all fired. They were all in some kind of exile place. They all found out only because the money didn't go into their banks, so they started crawling around. They were mostly, but not all, black. The overwhelming majority of them, black and white, never worked as teachers again. They were replaced by 22-year-old, overwhelmingly white kids from Ivy League schools in the north on a federal government program <coughs> the school board in New Orleans only had to pay $12,000 of their wages. So of course the school board took them. People who didn't last more than two years. People who didn't know how to teach. The whole school system, almost all of it, almost all of it, not all of it, 105 out of 115 schools of it was turned into charter schools. At the best charter schools, you are allowed to be a trade union member provided you don't mention it at work. At the bad ones, you're not allowed to be a trade union member. The charter schools, many of them insist on their teachers, these white kids from the Ivy League, coming in to work at 6 o'clock in the morning and going home at 6 And they, you know, they check you as you come in. 6 o'clock in the morning in, 6 o'clock in the evening out, 10 to 4 on Saturday. The, the older, <coughs> mostly black teachers hate them. The kids hate them because they've taken away the jobs of the black middle class. And, but people also, they want the charter schools. People want the charter schools because in America, when I, I, in 1971, there were 200,000 people in prison in America. Now there are 2 million adults in prison, a tenfold increase. The biggest imprisonment for outside of political imprisonment any, ever anywhere in the world for any population. Two million people in jail, 600,000 children in jail on top of that. In jails that are factories of rape. The jokes you see on the cop shows, factories of rape. In the, in the interviews, being asked the question, have you been raped in prison by people you don't know for a chip tech book? checkbox form, 20% say, yes, I was raped. And it's probably half. With the children, it's many more than half. The back of the envelope calculation is probably three million children have been raped in the years in America. And often, one of my friends was raped at least 15 times as first <coughs> night in Rikers Island. And it's over and over and over. This isn't a country that goes on about pedophiles and stranger danger. This is an enormous school, place of suffering. In New Orleans, it's not untypical. New Orleans is building a new city jail with room for 6,000 prisoners. 
6,000 prisoners, mostly young men, in a city of 300,000 and the sheriff's department is on a bonus system for every prisoner they put into the jail. <coughs> Terrible, endless suffering. It was done in order to break the black working class. Because the civil rights movement, the revolts in the cities, the center of that in the 60s, the center of that was the black working class. And they set out to break them. It's not Black people are only 45% of the people in jail. They had to break millions and millions and millions of white and Hispanic people too to do it. But they wanted to break them, and it breaks you. The majority of people who go into prison have children that they're in contact with, sons and daughters when they go in, men and women who go to prison, and the majority of the men and women when they come out never talk to their children again. They break families, everybody, everybody, everybody has people they love inside. In New Orleans, if you're black, really if you're working class in New Orleans, if you don't finish high school, you're going to go to that place. And everybody knows that. So everybody wants their kid beaten. Physically. You can't do it, but they want them beaten into line. Disciplined, put in uniforms, made to walk in rows so that they don't have to go to that place. Orleans. So they don't have to go that place. That's what everybody wants. <coughs> and in the charter schools, the stories the teachers told about charter schools, there's the charter schools, the lots and lots of charter schools where you can only walk one way down the hall, you have to walk all the way to the end of the hall and then back, and you're expelled for crossing from the hall from here to here because your classroom is here. There's one charter school last year when it opened in August. Every teacher in the school was instructed uh, to, in the same time period, they had to give their students 10 different instructions for how to clean your desk. Every kid cleaned their desk for the whole of that period. The teacher cleaned their desk too for the whole of that period. And then at the same time, two minutes before the bell, every teacher in the class was ordered to, to say to their class, they were ordered to look down at their desk and say, that desk looks clean. <laughs> That desk looks so clean I could lick it. And then they had to lick their desk. And every one of those teachers did it. And every one of them knew, and every kid knew, that that was because those kids were black and they were dirty. There's worse. There's a charter school I can hardly believe about, but they kept assuring me of it, where all the kids in the break times had to eat with their hands on their head. And then you're allowed to drink like that. Like that. Knife and fork too, hang back, fork like that. And not talk, no talking. And the teachers had to sit with the kids. The teachers were not allowed to put their hands on their head. Had to sit with the kids in their lunch break and enforce it. Because discipline, 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 to stop those kids going to prison. But you're replicating the prison in the schools. So a third of the kids, the kids with some dignity and some courage, they drop out. Because they cannot do that. This is, these are the hurts. These are the hurts also in an economy where all the jobs in the middle, the jobs in the middle are going. Terrible anxiety among skilled workers, among white collar workers, as those jobs disappear and you might fall down. Um, a country where, because of the school, the university fees, the average length of time that a person finishes university, spends at university, is nine years. But half of people who go to university don't graduate at all. A world of hurt and rage, and a world of hurt and rage in which there is nobody above. Nobody above. <coughs> who stands for you, who speaks for you, who talks the language of class. That means that when it comes, there will be an explosion. That explosion will be enraged. It will be violent in places, but it will be enraged. And the public joint expression of our rage will be liberated. Will be enormous. I don't know the timing, Two things accelerate the timing. One is it looks like America is going back into a double-dip recession. 
It looks like things will get worse and worse. But they may be able, it's so, the system is so screwed down, they've got people so united at the top, it may not be, it may be possible. But the other thing, Wisconsin happened because of Tiger Square. Because after 20 years of filthy Islamophobia, of prejudice and prejudice and war and war and war and war on Muslims, Americans saw what ordinary Muslims did and said, let's have some of that. And the more <laughs> the more that we can do around the world that they can see on their TVs, the faster they'll be able to do it. And when they do it, when 60,000 Americans, 60,000, only 60,000 Americans, demonstrated non-violently, very much as a minority, outside the WTO and the app, everyone in the world saw that. And that changed the kind of place the world was. When the American working class goes up, it will change the world. And do not be surprised by the pain, the bitterness, the rage, and the longing for dignity those people are